Thank you for coming and staying for the last session of the day. Hey, my name is Var Barbosa. I am a developer advocate for, at the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies at IBM, or CODE for short. And the goal for CODE is we try to make it easier to create, deploy, manage AI uh, models and AI technologies. And our goal is to make it more open and more consumable by all developers. And I should probably start by saying that I am not a machine learning expert, nor am I a data scientist. I sort of stumbled my way into machine learning, and I'm here to just talk about hey, what I've learned and how to get JavaScript developers more involved with machine learning. So this is where I would be telling you about machine learning is everywhere. It's all the hype behind AI. And, but there's a whole track of machine learning here at this conference. And there are people here who can probably do a lot better job of explaining all that to you than myself. So I'm going to skip over this part here. And actually, if you were at yesterday's open keynote, you would have probably also heard Erica Stanley give a great introduction to AI, machine learning, and deep learning uh, models. And what, I'm not going to repeat what she says, but the only thing I'm going to say here is the key takeaway is with machine learning and deep learning in particular is all you need is the right set of input data and answers, and then the machine will learn or infer what the rules and prediction are, uh, what the rules are. And once you have those rules, you have your model. And then once you provide a new data, it'll go ahead and run predictions, it, it give you the predictions or the probability of what that new data is or represents. So, and that's done through what, they like to call, what we like to call artificial neural networks. And on the left-hand side, you see an example of a single neuron. And artificial neural networks, they just basically mimic what the uh, biological neural networks in the human brain do. And in a single neuron, you can have any number of inputs here, for, uh, and the, labeled by the x's here. And each of these inputs uh, have some sort of weight associated with them. And what the neuron basically does, it takes uh, some, uh, some of the weights and uh, inputs, and then adds some sort of bias uh, to adjust that sum. And then it runs it through uh, what we call an activation function. And depending on the activation function, it'll determine whether or not that neuron fires or what output it produces. And on the right-hand side, you have a very simple example of what a neural network would look like. And it's just a number of connected neurons. So you have your input, where, for example, with an image, those could be the individual values of a pixel. And then you have your output, which is your prediction. And for example, it could be the probability that this image was of a dog or a cat and so on. And in the middle, you have your hidden layers. And the hidden layers basically fire depending on what the input is they basically uh, fire and connect to the other hidden layers. And you can have any number of hidden layers. And in a lot more, this is a very simplified explanation, but in a lot more cases, what you would have is anywhere from hundreds to thousands maybe of inputs and dozens to hundreds of uh, hidden layers, and then your output would give you a prediction. And a lot of this takes a lot of time, resources, a lot of data, a lot of computing, uh, power and a lot of knowledge around uh, machine learning. But if you want to get into creating these machine learning models, there are plenty of tools out there for you which uh, try to help you and make it a little easier for you. And one such tool is TensorFlow, which I want to point out over here, it's the one in the top left. And TensorFlow was developed by Google, and it was open source, I believe, in 2015. And what it is is basically a machine learning uh, a library to help create and uh, excuse me to help uh, create and uh, define your machine learning model and perform linear uh, uh, mathematic and equations on it. And most of these, in fact, all of these uh, tend to be Python based because given the Python's community and uh, the, the adoption in research, academics, uh, Python tends to be the go-to uh, language for machine learning models. But with TensorFlow, it was actually initially written in C. And they later on added bindings for Python, Java, as well as other programming languages. And there's even a binding for JavaScript called TensorFlow, a version of it. It's not a binding, it's a version of TensorFlow called TensorFlow.js for JavaScript. So what exactly is TensorFlow.js? It's an open source library to train and deploy machine learning models all within JavaScript. It, was, it started out as DeepLearn.js. And it was actually 
brought into the TensorFlow family a little over a year ago and renamed TensorFlow.js. And earlier this year, version 1.0 was released. And with the release of 1.0, they even tied it even more tightly to the TensorFlow API. So you may be thinking to yourself, with Python as the go-to language for machine learning, why even bother with JavaScript? Well, first of all, we're talking about JavaScript. And JavaScript is everywhere, so why not in machine learning? But more importantly, though, is there are over 12 million JavaScript and Node.js developers out there. So if you can bring machine learning into JavaScript, you take it out of just strictly being a Python ecosystem thing to it, the, perhaps the widest or most widely used programming language in the world. In addition, with like edge devices and brow with browsers and edge devices, you have sensors, you have cameras, you have microphones, it, you have access to all this data. And as we know, with machine learning, you need lots and lots and lots of data. And also with browsers, you have interactive UIs, and this can allow for very interesting and unique uh, sort of applications. And then there's data security. And with data security, if you think about it, in a traditional machine learning flow, the data is taken from the client and then sent onto a server somewhere where the uh, training can happen or the prediction can be run, and then the information is sent back to the end client. And, and now, if you think about the alternative where you have the machine learning and the model, excuse me, you have the data and the machine learning model directly on the device, then the training can happen on the device and the predictions all can happen on the device without having to send or worry about sending the data over the network to some security server elsewhere. Excuse me. And then there's the offline and low bandwidth scenario, where if you think about it, if both the model and the data are on the same device, you can perform inferencing or prediction and also do training all offline while the device is not connected or has or is an environment where it, excuse me, is in environments uh, where the network is not easily accessible and not uh, really reliable. So you can have real-time uh, machine learning uh, happening on the device offline in inv remote environments where there's no connection to any sort of network. So with that out of the way, we can take a uh, more closely look at TensorFlow.js. And when you download uh, TensorFlow.js or you install it, uh, you basically get what's in those four boxes there and you actually can download each of the individual modules individually if you don't want to, the, all four of them together. But first, we have the TF layers. And what that is, is the higher level abstraction uh, to the model. It's where you would use to create the layers and the models that I showed uh, earlier, where you can line up the layers and figure out how they each interconnect, interconnect with one another. And then you have TFJS core. That's the low level uh, portion of the TFJS. And that runs all your mathematical or computational uh, heavy duty computations. And what that does is it actually uses the GPU by way of the WebGL. So if you're not familiar with uh, WebGL, it's a 2D, 3D uh, drawing library. Uh, but rather than use it for drawing, TFJS Core uses it to perform some of that heavy mathematics and uses the GPU. But if there's no WebGL or there's no WebGPU in place, it'll default back to using the CPU. And next we have the TFJS converter, and I'm actually gonna touch on that a little bit later on, but that's used to convert models between different formats. And then we have TF data, and that's used just for handling and parsing and inputting and reading in the data of all sorts of various formats. And then we have TF viz, which is the visualization library to help you visualize the behavior that the model is uh, outputting and to also see some of the objects within TensorFlow.js. And then lastly, we have TFJS node, which is the, the node library, the node module. And unlike TFJS core, where in TFJS core, or actually in all of TFJS, everything is written in JavaScript. With TFJS node, much like the Python and Java and the other program language, it has a binding to the TensorFlow C library, so it'll use, reuse a lot of that code and it also has access to the GPU. And there are other parts to TFJS, which I don't include. There's a TFJS React Native component, which allows you to use it within React. There's also, oh, I can't think of it. There was, oh yes, there's ongoing work happening with WebGPU, which is a new standard coming up on as far as accessing GPU through the JavaScript and the browser client. 
So with that said, we have it, tensors, operations, and layers, which make up the core building blocks of uh, the uh, TFJS and your machine learning model. Tensors are the basic units. And tensors, basically, you can think of them as uh, buckets of numbers. They can be, uh, they're basically an n-dimensional uh, array-like structure. And tensors, the one thing to keep in mind with them is they're immutable. So once you create a tensor, you're unable to change it. If you need to change or make any updates to it, you're basically going to get yourself a new tensor back. And operations are what you use to manipulate or perform operations on those tensors. And like I mentioned, since tensors are immutable, operations, every operation you perform will actually return you a new, a, a new tensor. And then we have layers, which is basically the layers for the different model. And you use that to create and build your model and define how your network would look like. And we can actually take a quick look at this. Let's see. And actually, real quick, this is the TensorFlow.js website. And it's, it's a very good, and as far as its documentation, it has all the APIs and all the commands and all the functionality available to it. And as you can see, it's pretty extensive and pretty long. And each one of these, you can actually go in here and actually run and test most of the commands directly within uh, the browser itself there. But what I want to show you is here. And can you see that? Um, yep, all right. Right, so the first thing we have up here is I'm defining a tensor, and it's basically just TF tensor. And in this case, I'm using an n-dimensional array, a two-dimensional array to go ahead and define the tensor. And I'm just going to create the tensor and print it. And then after that, it shows in a different way to define a tensor. And this one, I just basically use a flat array. I pass it, and then I also pass it the shape that I want the tensor to be, which is a three by two by one in this case. And then the type, which can be int, a string, excuse, yeah, int, string, float, and I believe Boolean. And then lastly, there's some helper utilities that allow you to create the tensor more quickly. So you can do tf.scale if you're just creating a number, or for example, tf.4d if you want a four-dimensional array, or 5d, and so on. So if I quickly run this, it's not going to do much except just print out those values of the tensor that I create there. And you can see uh, we're basically the definition of a tensor. And actually, let me do this so you can see a little bit more. This will print out a little bit more information about the tensor. So, all, right. all right, so you see it has the type, the rank, the shape, and then the values of the tensor. So that is a tensor ob an object. And if we go a little further down, whoops. We can quickly take a look at operations. So here, I'm, it's just a simple add operation. I'm just taking one tensor, adding it to another, and then printing the output. But in the bottom, I'm doing a little bit, something a little bit more complex. Not really, but it's a little bit, I guess. So we take one tensor, we perform a dot product with another tensor, then we square it and print it. So if I run that real quick. See, we get the output of both of those tensors. Now, you see two tensors there in the output, but like I mentioned, these tensors, they're immutable. So when I, over here, when I'm running through this particular call right here where I create one tensor, a 1D tensor, a 2D tensor, then the dot and the square, that actually ends up creating four tensors. So now there are four tensors in memory. So we can look at how to deal with memory here. So, oops. So that, uh, for example, here I just threw some code in there, just performing a bunch of operations. And then I'm going to print out the tf.memory, and we can see uh, what's in memory at, at this point. And we see there it tells us the number of bytes being used, and the number of tensors is five. So even though I just have an A and B, there's actually five tensors that got created here. And one thing you can do, and you can imagine if this is in a for loop, then you start having all these tensors that you need to keep track of and, and try to take care of before you start running into memory leaks. So one, thing, uh, one way to, re to, f to resolve that is to call a dispose function. So I can do, for example, a dot dispose and b dot, oops. And that'll go ahead and dispose and clean up the tensor. 
so once I run this again, we can see now I only cleaned up A and B. There's still three other tensors that are running in there, which I didn't assign, but they're still in there. So uh, another alternative, if you don't want to keep track of each of the tensors yourself, you can go ahead and use the TF tidy, which TensorFlow will go ahead and keep track of the tensors for you, uh, for you. And then once the function is done, it'll go ahead and clean them all. So if I run this one, We see it clean up all the tenses for us and everything's done. And there are other, uh, other commands on there. So for example, if you wanted to keep the A tensor after the TF tidy that uh, runs, and you, know, you can, there's a keep that you can call. But now if we go a little further down, we can look at layers real quick and defining a TensorFlow model. So if we look at this code right here, first uh, I'm defining the type of model I want, and in this case I'm I have a sequential model, and a sequential model is basically just a stack of layers feeding linearly one from another. And then once I have that model, I can go ahead and add the layers, that, uh, for example, like you saw in the neural network diagram. And here I'm telling you there's uh, 50 neurons in this particular layer. This is the activation function that it's going to use. There are uh, several of them, and you can get it all from the API. This is the activation function it's going to use to fire on those neurons. And then I also, since this is the first layer, I have to provide it the shape of what the, uh, what's going to be coming in. And then I add, in this case, I added a second layer. And this layer only has one, uh, one neuron, and it's going to activate on the linear function. So once you have your model defined, what you would do is you would run the compile on it. And this configures and, compare, and prepares the model for training and evaluation. And in here, you're going to provide it the loss function. And the loss function is what's going to be used during training uh, to uh, determine how accurate uh, th the model is. And then the, uh, d depending on how accurate and how many iterations you're low, it's going to use the optimizer to go back, uh, use the optimizer algorithm to go back and adjust those weights and, and biases that we saw before. So uh, here in the X and Ys, I'm just creating some uh, tensors with just some random values. But when you're ready to train the model, you go ahead and run model.fit you'd pass it your input or your x's, and then your expected output, your y's, and then you'd provide it epochs or how many iterations you wanted to train. So after each one of those iterations, it's going to check the loss and then apply the optimization function and adjust the weights and biases and then run it again. And here, all I'm doing is going ahead and printing what the loss value is at that point. And in this case, I'm going to run it 100 times. And then once it's done, I'm ready to use, it, to use the model. I can save the model. Or in this case, I'm just going to run a prediction against that model with some random values. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. It's not going to do anything interesting because I'm just using a bunch of random values. And you see, as it's going here uh, through each of the iterations, uh, the loss is getting a little better. It's getting less and less. And the, the goal is always to try to get your loss as low as possible uh, when you're trying to train. And, and it all depends on the data you have and the, this type of model, how quickly that's going to happen, and uh, how much work needs to get put into that. All right. So that's tensors, operations, and layers. Let's go back to. So now that you have these basic building blocks in place, you can go ahead and start your own AI revolution, correct? <laughs> so probably not. So what some of you may be thinking is, there's a lot of models out there that are a lot more complex. And what I showed you is some uh, very basic stuff. And a, lo a lot of these models, the training portion, due to the complexity, can take days, if, if not weeks, to train. And that does not make a, a good for, a experience in the browser or on a mobile device or some edge devices. So what can you do in that case? Well, instead of training what a lot of the community has been doing and what we at Code A tend to focus on is actually running pre-trained models uh, within TensorFlow.js. And what this is is basically taking a model that's been trained elsewhere and then bringing it into TensorFlow.js and then just running it uh, on the browser or on the mobile or edge device. And the way you, uh, you get to this is through the TF, TF, excuse me, TensorFlow.js converter tool which is basically a Python command line utility that is used to convert uh, models from one format to another format. 
And then uh, once you have it in the, uh, once you convert it into the web format, you can go ahead and load it into the, in the TFJS uh, application and run with it. Uh, and to run TensorFlow.js, once you have it installed, it's pretty straightforward. You just provided the input of the model that you're working with, the format of the model that you're working with, the preferred output that you want it to convert to, and then the path of where it can find the model and the path of where it is to save the converted model. So uh, if you think about that, that sounds really wonderful. You can take your model, train it on some server that's really beefy, that's really been spec that's dedicated to creating, uh, to training and running these models, and it can be running for days, weeks on end, if it has to. And then once you have that model, you can go ahead, convert it, and then take it and run it into your JavaScript application. So you get the best of both worlds. And that is true, but the thing that to come to mind and to think about is, unfortunately, not all models can be converted. And the first thing, a block that you run into is the, a converter supports only TensorFlow and Keras models. So if you have a saved model, which is the preferred format of TensorFlow, or you have a frozen, uh, you can convert it. If you have a frozen graph, and actually this has changed as of TensorFlow.js converter uh, 1.0, frozen graphs are no longer supported. So if you actually want to convert a frozen graph, you would have to, it's recommended for you to downgrade to an older version of the converter. But you have HDF5 models, which are Keras models, and then there's also TensorFlow hub models. And so if you have these models, you can go ahead and convert them to the web format. But if you, uh, if you have an Onyx model or a PyTorch model, then you're not going to be able to convert that model. And unfortunately, that model won't be able to run in your TensorFlow.js environment. Uh, the other thing to think about is the, the model requirements. So the, uh, some models require special pre-processing of the input and special post-processing of the output. So you got to think about these, uh, these special pre- and post-processing. And can they be handled, or are they even worth doing in JavaScript? It may, not be, the, it may be the case that it can't be done in JavaScript, in which case you're probably not going to be able to use that model if you can't really process its input and or output. The other thing is the size of the model and the performance. So although you may be able to convert a 700 megabyte model, it, it may not be wise to actually try to run a model that size in a mobile device. So that's something to, uh, to think about. And there are uh, studies and options that you can do and work being done uh, in model optimization. But there's still uh, some models that there's only so much optimization that you can do and so much performance gains that you can be had. So in those cases, JavaScript probably is just not going to cut it for you. And perhaps the biggest uh, constraint with converting models is the number of supported operations. With TensorFlow.js, it's still fairly new. And it, I don't remember the exact number, but it supports roughly around 200 or so operations, while TensorFlow, on the other hand, supports over 800 operations. So what that means is if you have an operation, if your model has an operation that is not supported by TensorFlow.js, you're not going to be able to convert that model. Now, there are things you can do with that, so depending on where within the model graph that operation is and what that operation is, you may be able to work around that. But in some cases, uh, you're not going to be able to go ahead and support uh, and convert that model to TensorFlow.js without the support of that operation. And there's work going on now to try to increase these number of oper uh, operations. And with each release, more and more operations get introduced. But it's just going to take time to uh, get on par or even close to what TensorFlow currently has. So uh, with, even though with those limitations in place, I should probably uh, let you know that you can still do a lot with TensorFlow.js. So you don't need to wait for all those operations to become available. You don't need to wait for the browser or the mobile device to uh, gain uh, in, uh, significant performance enhancements. And you also don't need to wait, wait till you get your PhD degree in machine learning to stop playing around with machine learning and experiment, experimenting with TensorFlow.js. And I'm going to show you just a couple examples of things that are being done currently with TensorFlow.js. So the first is this command line utility called MagicCat. And what it does is it basically takes in an image or a directory of images. And then it gives you the information on all the objects found within those images. So you can use that to 
basically scan through a directory of images, find an image that has a particular object that you're interested in. Or you can use it to crop out a particular object out of the image. So for example, in this, example, uh, in this uh, image up here, I, I go ahead and scan the directory, had two images in the directory, one of a cow and another one of a sheep. And the sheep image also had a person in it. But then what I do is I use a magic cat, and I also tell it to remove the cow from the image. So it actually creates a brand new image without the cow in it. And this right here was actually created by a colleague of mine, uh, Nick Kasten. And he actually uses the image segmentation model and just converted it to TensorFlow.js and then runs it in a node application command line utility. Uh, another interesting and fun uh, application uh, that I got to work on with John Cohn here, who's an IBM distinguished engineer and our resident math scientist, is this idea of a video theremin. So basically what we did is we tried to make music uh, using the webcam on your phone or on a desk laptop and basically make music as your arms with just moving your arms around. So let's see if this plays. So as you can see, he's basically just moving his arms around and then depending on uh, what he does, it, it plays different music. So neither one of us are musicians, so <laughs> we can't play nothing really well, but it, it shows you some of the stuff you can do. Now, uh, with the key thing here is we use the open, excuse me, the PoseNet model for TensorFlow.js. And what that model does is it basically, it takes in an image and returns the, uh, the pose information of a person that in that, of all the people in that image. In this case, it's just one person. So then we take that pose information and we go ahead and we, uh, uh, we go ahead and transform it to MIDI notes. And we take those MIDI notes and you can use it to control a MIDI device. Or in this case, we just use it to play audio in the browser using the web audio API. And while those were some uh, pretty uh, entertaining and fun uh, applications that we've created, uh, a more serious and a, a more real world use case is drone aid. And for people uh, uh, who are not familiar, drone aid is, actually came about from IBM's Call for Code Global Challenge. And if you don't know what Call for Code is, it's a worldwide uh, challenge uh, for developers uh, to come up with technical solutions around natural disaster recovery, preparedness, and, and responsiveness. And drone aid was an entry last year. And the gentleman, Pedro Cruz, he's actually from Puerto Rico. And he has this uh, amazing story on uh, the inspiration behind creating drone aid. And I'll definitely ask you to check that out. But basically, what drone aid does is it takes video streams incoming from uh, drones flying over, for example, an area that's been hit by a natural disaster. And it's going to look for uh, uh, certain signs of help, like SOS uh, images or s signals. And then it'll take that information, and it can either plot it on a map or send it over, uh, over to the first responders with the location and what sort of help is required there. So what I have here is basically, I was just playing a, a actually, it was, it's been two weeks now, two weeks ago. They released this uh, open source with the TensorFlow.js model, and they've actually joined the Linux Foundation as a project as part of the Linux Foundation. And the screenshot here is basically me just playing around with the TensorFlow.js version of that model, trying to detect different signals uh, with a pre-recorded. I didn't have a drone at the time, so I basically just used a pre-recorded video taken uh, on my phone to go ahead and run the model against. And as it's, the video is playing, uh, the model is detecting all these signals and then just giving a count for them in this particular instance here. So with that, I hopefully have inspired you to think about machine learning in a different way and some in experimenting with TensorFlow.js. So what I want to say is thank you for coming here and listening to this talk, especially being the last one of the day. And you can go ahead and reach out to me at varbarbosa across most social media networks. And the URL in the bottom is actually the URL for the slides where you can get uh, all the notes for the slide along with uh, all the links to uh, all the content that I talked about. So at this time, I'm just going to say and see if anybody has any questions or uh, wanted me to go over something that I may have missed or they were hoping to get covered.
Uh, no questions at this time? Well, I'll be around a, a little bit longer if anybody needs anything. And again, thank you very much.